Good afternoon, everybody. And for those in the Middle East, good morning. I'm Bilahari Kaufikan, the chairman of the Middle East Institute. And we are very honored to have with us today Her Excellency Loa Rashid Al Qatar, the uh, Assistant Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Qatar Foreign Ministry and also the Ministry spokesperson. Her career has spanned a, a wide array of fields. I'm not going to try to uh, to, to read them out because it will take most of the time of this lecture. She has done so many things in her very in her short life because as you can see from the screen, she is still quite young. So it's obviously she's a child prodigy. But anyway, Your Excellency, welcome. My only regret is I do not have the pleasure of welcoming you to Singapore in person. Um, and I'm going to turn the floor over to you in a moment. Uh, but just one uh, word of administrative advice. Can those of you who are not me and not our guests, please turn off your volume and turn off your video because we have quite a number of people on screen from all over the world. And the more, of, the more, the more of you who turn on your video and volume, uh, the less stable the connection becomes. And we don't want to have our guests interrupted. So can I ask you to turn off your videos and turn off your uh, volume until you want to ask a question, which will be later. Now, Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Bilhari. It's uh, such an honor to be with you. I thank you and thank the Middle East Institute for the kind invitation. We've been talking for quite some time now about this uh, lecture, so I'm glad that I'm uh, finally uh, speaking. Um, I was uh, hoping that I would uh, be able to be in Singapore, but due to the pandemic, of course, hopefully uh, next year I can visit you in person. And this is also an open invitation for you to visit us in, in Doha and possibly participate with us in, in Doha Forum uh, as well. So um, our uh, lecture today is going to be about small states uh, in a contested era, a Qatari perspective. And if you allow me, I'll start with the end of this question or the statement that is, what is a contested era? How different is this contested era from what we have experienced as human beings in our uh, history in general? I'm not sure if you can see the screen. Yes, I can see the screen. Wonderful. A... So I'll, I'll start with the first uh, slide in this case. Yes. Please go ahead. Sure. I'm just having some technical difficulty. Yeah. Sounds wonderful. So the global order between two wars, and we're talking here about the first uh, 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 World War I, basically, and the war on terror, and whatever is in between uh, those two wars. Now, the question of peace and war um, has been always uh, centric to the question of politics and international relations. And it seems like the answer in the 20th century has been uh, revolving around uh, notions such as uh, more global collaboration, more multilateralism. After World War I, we saw, for example, the foundation of the League of Nations. But then this has served its objectives or perhaps failed to serve its objectives. So that was replaced by the United Nations. And of course, the discourse of the United Nations has developed over the years. This year, we're celebrating the 75th anniversary uh, of the uh, UN Charter. And there are many questions around multilateralism, around fixing the global order, or possibly disorder in, in this case. And as a matter of fact, we're currently uh, working on a report around the uh, UN uh, Charter. When I say we, this is the Doha Forum, uh, we in this uh, case. And then in the decades uh, after the Second World War, we witnessed the Cold War. Now, no matter how complicated the situation was back then, there was some sort of clarity. I mean, we had at the end of the day, two main camps, the United States on the one hand, Soviet Union on the other hand. Of course, there was the non-alignment movement, which was formally uh, a non-alignment movement. Realistically speaking, de facto, many of the members of uh, that movement were actually leaning towards one camp or the other. In other words, we had a bipolar 
uh, global order in one way or the other. But then in the 1990s, George Bush Sr. announced the new global order when the Soviet Union was out of the picture. Fokoyam, of course, talked about the end of history. The end of history meant the end of struggle. It meant a liberal, a liberal global order. It meant a, a global order that was revolving around notions such as democracy, uh, once again, human rights, multilateralism, in addition to free trade, the GATT agreement, the TRIPS agreement. But then suddenly, in the midst of all of that, we realized it was not the end of history. It was not the liberal global order that everyone had anticipated back then. We entered a new era, and there were many structural changes during that era. So some of those global structural changes, once again, we went from bipolarity to multipolarity, and in between, there was the dominance of one pole at one point of time. But the one element that is absolutely unprecedented in our human history is this complete fragmentation of almost everything. Fragmentation of ideas, fragmentation of policies, fragmentation of vision. And this is, in a way, paradoxical in the sense that, on the one hand, possibly thanks to uh, technology, but also thanks to many other notions, we are more interconnected than ever. And yet, with this unprecedented interconnectedness, we also see this unprecedented fragmentation. We have passed the world of big ideas. We no longer have big ideas that we revolve around as a global community. There are sub-ideas and sub-sub-ideas and sub-sub-sub-ideas. This is not just a theoretical assessment of the situation. This has many practical implications. In our policies in general, if we are asked to describe the policy of almost any country today in the international community, it becomes almost impossible to describe a consistent policy. And I remember a term that I'd like to borrow from one Italian colleague. He said, it's the world of a la carte policies. So it depends. In this part of the world, this situation, in that portfolio, there will always be a different policy. Now, the implications of this for small states, such as Qatar, such as Singapore, such as other countries, could be partially and tactically good in the sense that those small countries can navigate through the cracks of this international sometimes inconsistent system. But then strategically speaking, collectively speaking, this fragmentation is leading us to a very chaotic situation. And of course, there is the decline of multilateralism. And one of the most important yet overlooked structural changes is the shift from human rights centric discourse and policy to the anti-terrorism centric approach and policy. This change is not a rhetorical change. This change, in my opinion at least, is a paradigm shift. We are shifting everything from liberal notions, human rights notions, even if that was at one point of time just a rhetorical commitment, Today, we are giving up on even that rhetorical commitment. And with that shift to the anti-terrorism-centric approach, we see many notions and policies that were not tolerated in the past being tolerated today. Does this mean that we don't have the challenge of violent extremism and terrorism? Of course not. We do. But then the question here, what is the impact and the implications of those policies on our other policies in general? Now, to move from the big picture and to focus the discussion on small states.
trying to move the slides. Technology sometimes fails us. <laughs> One, uh, the, yeah, no, that's the other slide, yes. So what are the challenges facing small states? And from this slide, I'm going to move uh, to Qatar specifically. If we look at the Commonwealth as an example, we have 53 members, out of which 31 members are considered to be small states. What are the challenges that those small states are facing? Limited global influence, that's one thing. Weak technical capacity. Limited access to affordable finance. Disproportionate impact of natural disasters and climate change. Now, if we think about those challenges, and we try to draw an analogy with the state of Qatar, or even some other small states in the Gulf, the challenges are a bit different. There is somewhat an overlap when it comes to climate change, for example. Limited global influence, once again, it depends which portfolio. But then there is definitely a difference there. So if we look at Qatar's unique position, and I would say unique position even of some other uh, small Gulf states, Qatar is small in size. Qatar has massive natural resources. I mean, when it comes to the energy, the liquefied natural gas, Qatar contributes more than 33% of the global uh, production of the LNG. And the northern field in Qatar is one of the biggest reservoirs in the world. But at the same time, Qatar lives in a very heightened zone and Qatar suffers from drought. It's one of the dry land countries. If you look at the illustration, the diagram there, that is, of course, these are just some examples. So there's Qatar, there's Singapore, there's Norway, there's the Caribbean countries. And there are commonalities, obviously. I mean, Qatar and Singapore, for example, you're talking about small countries. You're talking about, uh, in terms of population, small size. But then one of the main differences is that Qatar has natural resources, whereas Singapore doesn't. Yet one of the common denominators between us is having unfriendly surrounding. And if we shift to Norway, they have a very friendly surrounding, lucky them. And they have natural resources. So this is one of the main differences between Norway and Singapore, but then one of the main common denominators between Norway and Qatar. The Caribbean countries, we had one session with a number of foreign ministers of the Caribbean countries to understand the commonalities and challenges and, and differences. So climate change seems to be a common concern. And we are in one way or the other at the two different ends of the spectrum in the sense that they suffer from hurricanes and whereas we suffer from just the opposite. It's just drought in general. And then, of course, one of the main differences is that Qatar has natural uh, resources where these uh, countries are suffering on that front. And there is a little note in the slide there that talks about the exceptionalism of the small Gulf states compared to many other small states. There is the financial surpluses and the ambition in general. And if I am to be more specific about Qatar, we went through an experience in 2017. That is the blockade of Qatar. It was the complete land, sky, uh, sea blockade. And just to understand the situation, Qatar has one land borders that was completely closed. And Qatar used to import 90%, that is 90% of its food and medical supplies from its neighbors. And of course, that completely stopped. So in the, especially in the first few weeks, it was a very difficult situation. Of course, the little photo uh, there down the slide became very famous. I mean, if you look it up, uh, when Qatar Airways had to ship uh, basically thousands of, uh, of cows uh, to Qatar because we, we had a, a dire need for uh, dairy products in, in general. But then that blockade uh, was a 
multidimensional one in the sense that it was coupled with an orchestrated media campaign against Qatar, accusing it of all sorts of accusations. There is the uh, attacks on Qatari currency. As a matter of fact, we have now a number of cases in a number of European countries uh, where we believe that uh, the blockading countries ha have used uh, some agencies and, and companies there to manipulate the Qatari real measures uh, against Qataris as individuals separating families. We're talking about apparently thousands of families that are separated. And of course, this has affected their, uh, the citizens of the other uh, GCC uh, blockading countries. And just to give you a bit of context, not the entire GCC is blockaded in Qatar. We enjoy excellent relations with countries like Kuwait and Oman. As a matter of fact, part of our diversification of our supply chains depended heavily on them as well. And then part of the measures against the individuals in Qatar, expelling them from hospitals, universities, and even the holy places, closing down businesses, Qatar Airways, for example, but also private businesses. Many of the businessmen in Qatar now, until this very day, cannot access their businesses and their properties in some of the other countries, blockading countries. Blocking uh, Qatar-based media. So if you are living, let's say, in Bahrain or United Arab Emirates, you cannot uh, access uh, Qatari newspapers uh, and so and Qatari websites. In addition to introducing sympathy laws as well. So anyone who shows sympathy with Qatar uh, would subject uh, himself or herself to a penalty or prison, in addition to pirating BN Sports channels. Now, BN Sports is this giant of uh, sports media that has exclus exclusive uh, rights, pardon me, uh, of broadcasting many championships uh, and the World Cup as well. So that was actually pirated. Uh, and we, we just won a case at the WTO against this uh, piracy. Now, if we are to look at that experience, what did Qatar do right? And maybe I should just go back uh, to two steps and, and say that during the, the blockade, I was in the United Kingdom and many of my colleagues with whom I was talking and, and discussing were telling me Qatar is done, that's it. I remember attending uh, one session at Chatham House uh, and the panelist said just give them two, three weeks and Qatar would surrender. Of course, we're talking now in 2020 and this has not happened. So the question is, Qatar as a small state, surrounded uh, by unfriendly environment, how was it able to overcome and, and diffuse many of those measures? I don't believe that one size fits all. There are elements that will be beneficial for other small states, other elements that are just very Qatar specific uh, in one way or the other. But then if you look at that pyramid, it has a number of elements. Military prevention, food security, medical uh, security, medical needs, media and communication, wealth, our wealth sovereign fund, other investment authority played a huge role in the beginning of the blockade, the legal movement, and I'll come to that in, in details, public diplomacy, uh, energy uh, expansion, and this might uh, sound uh, paradoxical uh, that Qatar is under blockade, yet it has expanded, and, and there is a philosophy behind this as well. But then, the first three crucial moves in the first three weeks that we got right were the following. Military prevention, and this went in two ways. One, as many of you would know, we have the American military base in Qatar. So communicating with our American allies uh, and the state or the Department of, of Defense uh, in, in the US played a huge role in deterring the possibility of an invasion. In addition to that was the also agreement that we had signed actually with Turkey prior to the blockade and it was accelerated during the blockade and within a few days, we also received some support on that front. First, uh, the late Amir of Kuwait, Sheikh Sabah, said that we, and he meant we as, as uh, mediators, were able 
to stop a military invasion of Al Qadr. So once again, the military movement, but then the, the mediation played a role in that. Political resilience, that's important as well. Our foreign minister in the first few days used to go to three different countries on the same day, explaining our narrative. Because in the beginning, we received many, many questions. The campaign against us was just massive. We didn't expect it. And that's why there was a lot, a lot, a lot of work to clarify our positions to our allies. And I should recall here the position of Germany. The foreign minister of Germany was the first top official in the international community to make any comment against the measures that were taken against Qatar. That played a huge role in shifting the dynamics, diplomatically speaking. Because after that, we saw a number of countries condemning the measures. And by the end of 2017, we saw even the French president here in Doha in December talking about the need to stop some of the measures against the Qatari people in general. And then, of course, the immediate alternative supply chains. We were able to secure alternative passages. A number of countries played a role in that including Iran played a role in that. And ironically enough, at the time, we had no diplomatic ties with Iran. We had cut them off in solidarity uh, with Saudi a year before the blockade. But then we managed to go beyond those passages. We have secured other alternatives with our friends in Iran, our friends in Kuwait, our friends in Iraq as well. And we have launched our new port, which currently uh, dominates or constitutes around 30% of the trade in the uh, Middle East, even though it was only launched in 2017. And despite all the challenges that are facing international organizations, I started off with that and how multilateralism in general is declining. Yet, interestingly enough, we found out that pursuing those paths in general, when it comes to international law and international organizations and United Nations uh, agencies, we found that this still has some sort of impact and authority. And I'll come to the details of that. I have a, a detailed table. If we put this vis-a-vis -vis the undermining of international law and the approach of the blockading countries, I would tell you that much of what we have achieved, we did not achieve because of our brilliance, for example, as much as we have achieved because of the mistakes of the other countries who thought that they can pursue informal ways and bypass international law altogether. The piracy of the sports and many and the manipulation of the currency are just some examples. And at the communication level, it was interesting to see the strategy that the blockading countries uh, followed, because this became clear later on. It was not clear to us in the very beginning. And that is resorting to third tier media and orchestrated campaigns on social media through bots. This was not clear in the very beginning. Now, I should admit, tactically, that was influential. Strategically, I think this became very problematic for them because it portrayed them in a certain way. For example, Twitter has suspended, and only two weeks ago, conti continued suspending more accounts. Many, many fake accounts that are owned by state agencies or affiliated with state agencies, including individuals and Twitters who are suspended because of the relationship to some of those countries. So my point here is, once again, yes, we might be living in a post-truth era, if we wish. Uh, fake news is all over the place. We saw that with the pandemic, for example. Yet, it seems like factual approaches, rational approaches, still resonate in the long run. And that's why, for example, when you go to first-tier media, 
you see hardly any presence to many of the narratives that we see in the third tier media propagated through agencies and agents of uh, the blockade countries. Pursuing more rational approaches, more fact-based approaches, is not a bad choice at the end of the day, it turned out. The hidden factor, of course, in all of that is the unity of the internal front. Uh, many were counting uh, on some sort of a disintegration within uh, the society of Qatar. This did not happen, and this was certainly very helpful. Now, resilience and multidimensional and the multidimensional approach, once again, as I mentioned, I mean, we have around maybe 18 international cases against the blockading countries, uh, the ICJ, International Court of Justice, uh, World Trade Organization, the ICAO, the Aviation Organization, and uh, CERT Committee at the UN. Just to give you a few examples, for example, with the air disputes, we have proceedings under the Convention on the International Civil Aviation and the International Air Services Transit Agreement, Human Rights Front, we have proceedings before the International Court of Justice under the International Convention on the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination. Uh, once again, uh, Human Rights Front, we have proceedings before the CERT Committee under the International Convention on all um, uh, on the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination, pardon me. Uh, Trade-wise, we have a case against the piracy of Indian sports, which I referred to earlier. We continue with trade. There is a case also against uh, one of the blockade countries before the World Trade Organization. As a matter of fact, two of them, not one. Uh, postal services uh, disputes. We have interstate arbitrations instituted under the framework of the Universal Postal Union. Currency manipulation, we have cases in London, we have also cases in other countries that uh, unfortunately some blockading countries try to play with, invoke the systems uh, there and using some agencies and institutions. So beyond the multi-dimensional approach, there is an important lesson there. And I think it's a lesson for all small states. This lesson is diversifying dependencies. Very important. The old saying uh, says or states that uh, one should not be putting all the eggs in, in one basket. And this is exactly the lesson. So diversifying economic dependencies through diversifying the supply chains. Our mistake in the past was depending on one or two supply chains with no alternatives. Political dependencies. Once again, I mean, it's very important for small states to remain as much as possible neutral in many uh, disputes and be useful at the same time. And I'll be talking a little bit about how small states can be useful, how other try to be useful in mediation some of the disputes. So diversifying political dependencies is extremely important, cannot emphasize this enough, and diversifying our security dependencies. Military-wise, but also security in its very holistic sense, for example, uh, food security. So just to read some facts here, Qatar currently ranks uh, as the first country in the Middle East and the 13th in the world for food security, according to the Global Food Security Index in 2019. In 2017, that's the year of the blockade, Qatar's GDP actually increased, interestingly enough. Today, we outnumber the other uh, countries in the, in the GCC when it comes to those indicators as well in terms of our expansion in the LNG sector, Qatar Petroleum QP is raising its LNG production capacity to 121 million tons per annum by 2027. And QP, Qatar uh, Petroleum, continues uh, basically expanding its projects and agreements. Just to give you an example, it has signed an agreement with ExxonMobil to uh, construct uh, a project on the Texas Gulf Coast. That's one example. Interestingly enough, Qatar Petroleum actually participated in establishing 
a company in Egypt, and it was announced in 2019. Egypt, of course, is one of the blockading countries. Yet, the strategic decision that Qatar has taken when it comes to the energy is not to politicize the energy sector. At the end of the day, Qatar, when it comes to energy, is considered one of the leaders and politicizing this sector is going to be problematic for everyone. The, uh, I think it's called the uh, refinery company, Egypt refinery uh, company that was announced in 2019. In addition to that, Qatar continues uh, along the lines of not politicizing the sector, continues to support and supply the United Arab Emirates with its uh, LNG needs. Uh, around 40% of UAE's LNG consumption comes from Qatar through a pipeline and project, a joint venture to Qatar and the UAE called Dolphin. If we move to the um, second slide, how small states can be relevant and useful? That's an important element as well. I'll, I'll give two examples, one in COVID-19 and one is beyond COVID-19. And honestly, with this slide, I was thinking, shall I say be relevant, be useful, or be indispensable? But then I came to realize that it seems like all countries, and especially small countries in the world global order that we're living in, uh, could be spareable. So it will not be accurate for my side to say this, but at least to be relevant and useful. In COVID-19, for example, Qatar Airways is one of the very few airlines that, is, uh, that are still operating and connecting the different global destinations together. We have received unlimited requests from different countries, companies, institutions, the UN, to support with repatriating citizens or employees back to their countries or back to places where they need to do necessary operations and, and jobs. Qatar Airways so far repatriated around 2 million global citizens. In addition to that, we're partnering with the NATO to airlift uh, medical uh, aid and uh, humanitarian aid to a number of countries. Qatar Airways provides 30% discount on medical and COVID-19 related cargo. Many of these projects are supported uh, by the, uh, or the repatriation specifically of many citizens. It's actually supported directly by the Qatar government. In other words, we pay Qatar Airways to do that because Qatar Airways is uh, a private company. If we move to being relevant and being useful um, at a political level, I mean, this table shows some of those mediation efforts since 2017. So in 2017, Qatar mediated a, a ceasefire uh, agreement between, at the time, uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, who was the president at the time, and, and the Houthis. In 2018, the Lebanese factions, I mean, for 18 months, uh, Lebanon went into a presidential vacuum, and Qatar helped basically bridge the gap and uh, to bridge the gap, the gap, pardon me, and resolve the situation back then. Um, I remember some of our diplomats, when they talk about this experience, those who experienced it firsthand, uh, they said at one point of time, we had to lock down all the politicians in one place here in Qatar, the Sheraton, uh, which is probably known to you, uh, Professor Bilhari. Yeah. So, um, and that was uh, the way to reach an agreement. In 2009, Sudan and Chad, there was a, a mediation as well and uh, ended uh, by signing the Doha Accord. In 2010, Djibouti and Eritrea, once again, there was a, a ceasefire and an agreement. As a matter of fact, at one point of, of time, we had Qatari personnel at the borders uh, there uh, 2011, the Sudanese government and the rebel factions, uh, as the Arabic representative uh, at the time, there was uh, a mediation uh, or a number of mediation uh, rounds uh, ended with the signing in 2011, Sudan and Eritrea, 
uh, Feth and Hamas. Now, unfortunately, I mean, there was an agreement that was signed, but of course, the situation there is very much complicated. Yet, I should say uh, one point here. I think the positioning of Qatar, unlike many other parties who have alienated themselves in one way or the other when it comes to the Palestinians, gives it some sort of an advantage to be able to mediate, not only within the Palestinian factions, but across the board between the Palestinians and the Israelis as well. In fact, only recently, we have helped de-escalate the situation in Gaza between uh, Hamas and uh, Israel. So once again, I mean, Qatar is in a position where it can talk to all parties with absolute neutrality and is perceived as, as such. 2015 in Libya, uh, once again, between the Tawarq and Tabu, uh, the two uh, tribes, there was an agreement and uh, mediation. Now, the famous uh, Taliban US agreement, I say the famous because it's only recent, it was signed in February, the 29th of February 2020. And in addition to that, uh, we have currently, as we're talking, the intra Afghan Afghan negotiations as well. So the, the main two parties in Afghanistan are currently in negotiations. Those efforts uh, did not come out of the blue or happen overnight. Uh, it took Qatar and the US and some other countries who, at one point of time, basically facilitated or helped, such as Norway or Germany, uh, took us a number of years. And we're glad that this was finally crowned with some success. We're hoping that uh, all the parties will maintain their uh, part of the agreement. More than happy to elaborate on the elements of the agreement or any other questions that you might have. And I think one of the successful stories that we have here in Qatar is the fact that in the uh, negotiation uh, team from the government side, we have a number of women representing not only Afghan women, representing all of Afghanistan as well. The fact that Taliban are currently sitting with Afghan women, this is definitely a milestone. And we are seeing changes in the dynamics. I was absolutely surprised when I saw some of the members from the Taliban negotiation, uh, negotiation team showing so much respect, almost standing up when they see some of the Afghan women uh, passing by. Now, once again, there is a breakthrough there. We need to build on that and uh, wish them best of luck at the end of the day. The Afghanistan question can only be resolved by the Afghans themselves, and we're only facilitators there. Small states can play a role in diffusing polarization. We saw the tensions at the beginning of this year, 2020, between Iran and the United States after the attack on the embassy in Iraq, and then the uh, attack that killed General Soleimani. Qatar, alongside other countries, played a role in diffusing the tensions and we think that small states should perceive the role as a role of de-escalation, avoiding polarization, and we should not be uh, falling a prey of polarization and taking sides and, and axes. I'll conclude with this note. I, I realize that I have taken more time than I should have taken. But just beyond politics, if, if you allow me, Professor uh, Lamar. One of, one of the main questions uh, when it comes to uh, small states, beyond politics, beyond uh, the hard elements, is a question of identity, right? I mean, if you look at the photos of this slide, it's interesting, simply because all of these photos belong to the same place in Qatar, the same landmark. One of them, as you can see, is the amphitheater. 
as Roman architecture. You see that these two kind of towers, traditional towers, this is Qatari traditional architecture. You see this very awkward looking building? It's actually a gift, it's, it's like a gift box. It's, it's a building, it's an actual building. Is this modern, is this postmodern? I don't know, but it's for sure not a traditional kind of architecture. And then you see this building, that's just another photo of the previous one. And you see these two sculptures. I'm not sure if you can see this, the cursor, but one of them looks like a soldier with a mask, an awkward mask. And the other one um, is a woman, I think, holding the globe. All of these photos belong to this same place and landmark. If I may ask you, Professor Belhari, to give me some comments. What comes to your mind when you see that? Which one? All of that. The slide. Well, I am a different position because I've been to your country. And I think what you have done architecturally to create a, a city which is modern, but of the region and unique, is something uh, really admirable. You have made the city as a destination in itself. That's what comes to my mind. Thank you very much, Professor Bilhari. I, I have a friend of mine who's, who's an architect. Yeah. And because she's an architect, she keeps complaining about the identity, right? Yeah. What identity? Where's our identity? And at one point of time, I was curious, right? Yeah. Up until recently, I was in a discussion with a group of colleagues who studied history, and they were talking about the formations of identities in the Arab region in the late 19th century, when we had colonial powers on the one hand, Ottoman Empire on the other hand. Are we Arabs? Are we Ottomans? Are we Muslims? Are we Christians? Are we... It's just this smash of identities in a way, right? And as they were discussing and describing, it suddenly made absolute sense in my mind. It clicked that unlike what my architect friend is, was saying, this is the actual representation of the current formation of the Qatari identity in the sense that it's, it's basically a mix of different timelines yes. belonging to a certain tradition, but then being modern having a cosmopolitan city with 120 plus nationalities, but then longing to Arabic language, for example, or certain elements in the Qatari traditional culture. Globalization. All of these elements are kind of being mixed together and are reflected in the kind of the very diverse landscape that we see, a mix of timelines, a mix of cultures, a mix of different types of architecture, a mix of views of the world. This is probably what we're going through. Now, the question is, is this specific to small states? Is this specific to Qatar? Is this specific to, since we're talking about Middle East, to Muslim or Arab countries? In fact, the answer is no. Someone like Samuel Huntington wrote a book saying, who are we? The challenges facing America's identity. And he talked about the influence of the Mexican culture and globalization and pizza. And so it seems like all countries are going through this struggle. And I know from talking to many friends in Singapore, the question of identity is definitely one that is present in Singapore as well. I'll conclude with this point. There are many lessons to draw from Singapore's experience. Not least is its model of human capital development. This is one of the things that I think here in Qatar and in many other countries, we need to learn a lot about.
Thank you so much, Professor, and my sincere apologies. I might have taken more time than I should have. No, I'm, I'm only sorry that we did not allocate enough time for you because what you have had to say is uh, fascinating and extremely relevant to uh, Singapore and, in fact, to all small states. Uh, I, as I understand it, you have very kindly agreed to take a few questions. Is that correct? Is that all right with you? My pleasure, absolutely. Yes. I've, had, I've already got a huge list of questions from the <laughs> audience, and which, by the way, is an international audience. You've got people from the Middle East, you've got people to Japan. I've seen the list and, I, and, and anywhere in between. And you have a, quite a number of senior civil servants from Singapore who uh, signed up eager to learn lessons because we may find ourselves in the situation you were uh, not too long ago. Uh, uh, you were uh, right now. Well, you, as you know, Excellency, I was in Qatar just about a year ago, uh, Doha and the blockade had been going on for two years. Let me tell you what uh, struck me most. What struck me most is that nothing struck me. Life was normal. And I thought that was a, a major achievement. And from that, I'm going to uh, exercise the moderator's privilege and ask the first question. Um, you talked about building internal front uh, unity and I want you to, perhaps, if you can, expand a little bit on that. As I said, what impressed me most is life going on normally. Obviously, you took certain steps to make sure that, you know, supplies of food and other things continued. But beyond that, was there something you did to show up the psychological resilience of your people? Or is this something that grew organically because, when, uh, because you were under uh, pressure from outside? That's a very good point. I think the short answer would be, we were all surprised by the reaction. Uh, I think it grew just organically. The people felt that this attack was an attack on them, not on the government. And let me just draw a comparison here. So we had a diplomatic dispute in 2014 with the same countries, and they did recall their ambassadors. Back then, the reaction from the internal front in Qatar, the society in Qatar, was not as strong because they didn't feel like there was something that was attacking them. And the discourse was the following. If you do like content analysis of the social media, it was the following. It was, I mean, this is a dispute between, like a state to state dispute between the politicians. Keep it between the politicians. But then in this very blockade, it was a different case because the regular individual felt it. Many of them, as I mentioned, uh, were expelled, for example, it was during Ramadan, the holy month of Ramadan. So many of them were actually performing Umrah in Mecca. They were expelled, so they, of course they felt it. And not only that, they had no route to go back to Qatar because uh, flights have been suspended. Uh, another element was actually what the residents, not only the citizens, and this is a very important point, uh, Professor, because Qatar, at the end of the day, the population of Qatar is made up of different constitutes. Like, uh, we have the citizens, we have the residents, and of course, there is another breakdown, but the citizens are only maybe 12% of the population, or 15% of the population which meant that the reaction was a collective reaction by everyone. And once again, I think the main reason was that the individuals felt it. For days, people didn't find milk, for example. So for mothers, that was something they could relate to. It's, it's very simple and straightforward. It's not some political issue happening somewhere. But then the question is, how did Qatar change its discourse based on that? Immediately after that, in every single speech of His Highness, for example, he always addresses citizens and residents. So once again, there was something that happened organically, but then the state of Qatar, the government of Qatar realized that this is something to capitalize on, and indeed this is what happened.
Thank you. I have a question here from somebody in Singapore uh, about energy. Um, as you had mentioned, you are one of the largest and most important suppliers of natural gas in the world, with one of the largest reserves in the world. Has the experience you have undergone, you have gone through in the last three years, plus the looming threat of climate change, uh, in any way change how you look or your plans for securing your own energy needs in the future? What are your energy security plans, in other words? Or do you That's a very good need one? Could you hear yeah, the question? That's, yeah, absolutely. That's a very good uh, point and very good question. Now, there is definitely a shift from oil to natural gas. To start talking about a shift from natural gas into something else is still at a very early stage, uh, very theoretical uh, indeed. The reality of the situation is, I mean, if we look at the discourse about the decline for need for oil, this has been the rhetoric since the 70s, and the demand has only increased. Now, we think that with natural gas, there will be a demand at least for the coming 20, 30 years. Does this mean that we're not climbing beyond that? Of course not. Qatar and its 2030 vision talked a lot about diversifying the economy. But after the blockade, this became an urgent need for a number of reasons. What if the supply uh, chains are cut off for one reason or the other? The Strait of Hormuz is uh, erupted for one uh, reason or the other. What are the alternatives? What are the alternatives for exporting natural gas? And what are the alternatives of natural gas. Currently, we're undergoing a serious exercise that is basically revisiting everything about what we have been doing to diversify our economy. Some steps were taken in the past. There is the realization that it was not at the right pace and that it was not necessarily always in the right direction. To give you one example, Qatar at the end of the day is living within certain realities. Realities of the uh, climate, realities of uh, you know, its surrounding, the fact that it's in a very heightened zone, and so on and so forth. So we need to rethink our options. For example, when we talk about tourism, what do we mean by that? We don't have the natural elements for that. So what are the, the alternatives? Uh, can we talk about capitalizing on some of the options that we have? We have Education City in Qatar with seven uh, American branch campuses of one of the top, some of the top uh, universities. Can we capitalize on this in terms of turning this into a hub for uh, education? And so on and so forth. But it's too early to talk about concrete uh, achievements on that front. Thank you. I see that uh, Chan Heng Chi, Ambassador Chan Heng Chi, has raised her hand. She, by the way, uh, Your Excellency, she used to be my professor when I was an undergraduate. So I dare not not acknowledge her. And therefore, I will give her the floor now uh, to ask the, her question. Heng Chi, can you uh, unmute yourself? and ask your question. Uh, sure. Uh, my video is off, okay? Well, put it on. We'd like to see you, you know. Uh, I can't. Okay, never mind. <laughs> right. Uh, thank you very much, Your Excellency. That was a very clear exposition and very honest and frank exposition of uh, Qatar's... Uh, uh, start your video. Okay, hold it. Okay, thank you. Uh, of the um, situation that Qatar is in. My question is this, given the recent UAE-Israel agreement and the fact that other Middle East countries and Gulf states are signing on, it seems, including some of your 
present allies, uh, I gather Oman is interested and so is Kuwait. Do you feel your Qatar's strategic space is further narrowed? And I guess it comes back to the question of the small state. How does a small state maintain a singular position against all surrounding states? So a particular, but the general. Thank you very much, Professor. May I answer uh, directly? Go ahead. Thank you. That's actually an excellent question and a question that we keep asking ourselves. Now, if I am to be very specific about the peace agreements or the agreements that were uh, signed between some of the GCC countries uh, and uh, Israel, our position was uh, clear and we communicated this publicly. I'll cl clarify the position and then come to your question specifically. We were very clear that this was a bilateral matter in the sense that, I mean, this does not have any impact, if you think about it, on the path of the peace negotiations between the Palestinians and the Israelis. And that's why we don't think that this is the answer. The core of the struggle was between two main parties. One of those two main parties, i.e. the Palestinians, were completely up to the picture. So talking about resolving the current conflict, the 70 plus year conflict, through agreements that excluded one of the parties, I don't think that we can see a relationship or a causality there. The core of the conflict is that there was a peace agreement that was signed in Oslo. It was not fulfilled. And ironically enough, if you think about it, the two leaders who signed that agreement, one of them was assassinated, not by the Palestinians. The other one died under siege, not by the Palestinians. Settlements continue to be built. And of course, the violations continue. So once again, a peace agreement needs to be inclusive, needs to be just, and needs to be long lasting. Now to your question, how can Qatar hold onto its position when the surrounding is changing? We don't think that those agreements that were signed did actually impact Qatar's strategic relevance to what's happening for a reason. Qatar now is in a better position in the sense that it can talk to all parties. Whereas some of its neighbors have alienated themselves from the Palestinians. The Palestinian Authority, as you can imagine, is not satisfied with many of those steps. And hence their willingness, this is an assessment from our side, but of course they can speak for themselves, the willingness to work with some of those countries is probably less than it used to be. How can Qatar hold into its positions in general, not specific to this case? That's an important question. And I think it depends on what case are we talking about? What position are we talking about? Is it strategic? Is it a position that pertains to our core values? Or is it something that is subject to multiplicity of opinions and interpretations and positions and, and geopolitical dynamics and changes? If it's something that is related to our core values, our position is once again going to the point of diversifying dependencies, and this is important for all small states. It's important that any small state to hold into its very core and basic positions, to find allies, to find friends, to find like-minded people, countries, institutions. And in the collage of opinions and positions and ideas that we, we have today in the global 
arena, I think it's always possible to find that. I hope I was able to answer at least part of the question. Well, I think you answered the question very comprehensively. In fact, a number of people had asked more or less the same question, and I think you have answered them all at one go. There is another cluster of questions, Excellency, uh, all relating to the US. And rather than give it to save time, uh, rather than giving each individual the floor, I will try to summarize the questions uh, and bundle them into one. And if I do that, I would say it, it this way. Um, in, a, in a little under three weeks, we are going to have a presidential election uh, in the United States. And presidential elections are always important, and perhaps this one is more than usually important. Uh, if we are to believe the polls, we will have a new president. Joe Biden will be the next president of the United States, if we are to believe the polls. And that's, I think, a fairly big if these days. Uh, but if that is so, what kind, of, um, what kind of changes in American approach to the Middle East would you expect? And in particular, would you expect a different approach towards Iran? And finally, would you see a role for Qatar in bringing some kind of, perhaps reconciliation is too strong a word, uh, some, kind of, uh, some kind of mediating role between uh, the US and Iran for Qatar? In other words, okay, just to summarize, if there is a new president, how will US policy in the Middle East change? Uh, what, how will those changes specifically uh, impact Qatar's relations with its neighbors? And finally, how will it impact uh, US relations with Iran? And can Qatar play a role in uh, stabilizing that relationship, US-Iran? Over to you. Thank you very much. That's definitely a complicated question, as, as you can imagine. <laughs> it, it depends on, on just too many variables here. Now, it's very difficult to speculate, and it's always, in this case, helpful to go back to the individuals themselves and the statements that they have made. So, uh, in the case of uh, basically Joe Biden, he has made some statements, public statements. Now, whether, it, of course, if he becomes the next president, whether this is going to be fulfilled completely, changed slightly, is always subject to many variables. Yet, what I can talk about, instead of trying to talk about, or on behalf of uh, the uh, American side, let me try to talk about the Qatari side and, and how we perceive it and how we hope the region in general uh, should look like, regardless of who comes. Because this has been our consistent message with the current administration, and it will be our message to the next administration. We don't need further polarization in our region. We have our own differences with a number of countries in the region, when it comes to their foreign policy, when it comes to many other things. Yet, we came to realize, after all of these conflicts that our region went through, that we need to find an equation for coexistence. And I don't want to let go of our agency as a Gulf as well. We have a huge responsibility upon our shoulders. And we said it several times, regardless of the changes in other countries, we should have our own clear policy. What's our policy towards Iran? What's our policy towards other countries in the region? Unless we answer this question for ourselves, no one else will be able to figure it out for us. So once again, I think claiming more leadership from the side of the GCC is going to be helpful. 
But of course, to do that, we need to organize ourselves and uh, resolve the current conflicts that are currently uh, keeping us uh, busy with, I would say, marginal conflicts. Thank you. Um, Fazul, Fazul Rahman, who is a board member uh, of the Middle East Institute here, has raised his hand. Fazul, you have the floor. Please ask one of your questions, perhaps whichever you wish. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, your Excellency, Mr. Lower, I'm Ashif Fazul. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, good afternoon. Uh, especially since it's late afternoon there in Qatar. Uh, late morning there. Uh, good to be reconnected with you as I first met you uh, in Qatar when you were with Qatar Foundation with, doing the research. Uh, I was living there with my family. I think that's about 10 years ago. <laughs> so oh my God, bless you. Very <laughs> <laughs> good to see you, Doctor. Yeah. <laughs> remember. Yeah. Uh, congratulations <laughs> and uh, that you have made all the way to become the Assistant Foreign Minister and Spokesperson for Qatar. Uh, I, I have two questions, but I think the, uh, the, the question on Israel has been uh, asked just now. So I will just ask on the, uh, regarding the ongoing blockade, uh, as we have seen the leadership renewal in Kuwait and Oman. Uh, may Allah bless both late rulers uh, who were both active, especially the Emir of Kuwait, uh, in re reconciliation efforts. Do you see the two new rulers? Uh, playing the same active role. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and it's great to, to see you. You reminded me of very good days, uh, the days of uh, Qatar Foundation and, and, and research in general. So regarding the um, regarding Oman and, and Kuwait, in fact, we see a continuation of, of uh, the foreign policy. We haven't seen yet any sign that uh, there is a drastic change. In terms of the role of uh, Kuwait in mediating the conflict, only recently, uh, His Excellency, uh, the Foreign Minister of Qatar, was uh, in Kuwait, and uh, there were messages uh, coming back and forth, which means that the role continues and will continue. We wish both countries uh, stability. I mean, the transition of uh, power that we saw in, uh, in Kuwait is uh, to be lauded how smooth it was. And uh, everyone was, uh, as much as we were sad uh, and shocked, as a matter of fact, and despite, I mean, his age, uh, late uh, Amir of Kuwait, His Highness Sheikh Sabah, May uh, his soul rest in peace. I mean, despite his age, we were still uh, in, in, on, like shocked when uh, we received the news. My point is, this man had such a huge role in the region in general. So losing him was a, a loss for all of us. And that's why now that we see Kuwait continuing on the same path, we are actually very glad and, and comfortable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are a couple of questions on climate change and I'll cluster them together. Uh, first of all, you mentioned it briefly in your opening remarks when you talked about a bit about drought. Uh, but beyond drought, how would you see the impact of climate on the Gulf as a whole. And the Gulf is not a very large region, it's a fairly compact region. Uh, and obviously it would be more effective if countries in the Gulf, whatever their other uh, differences of opinion, could somehow coordinate efforts to deal with climate change. Do you see any prospect of that? And what are Qatar's own plans to deal with climate change? Once again, that's an important uh, question. I think for us in the GCC, there is a lot that is yet to be done. The 
concept of climate change uh, came to us and became part of the decision making and the awareness of, of decision makers uh, recently. We should recognize uh, this uh, fact. Now, there's this fact and then the fact that the GCC countries depend heavily on hydrocarbon resources that are not necessarily the cleanest source of, of uh, energy. And on the other hand, we have our other challenges. Countries like Qatar or uh, even uh, Kuwait or United Arab Emirates, we have the same problem of, of drought. In the case of Oman, it's a little bit different maybe. Uh, in the case of Saudi, because it's, it's bigger in terms of its landscape, once again, it can be a little bit different. Yet, food security is a common problem for all of us. So the point here is that, yes, there is a possibility to have technical coordination. There are many technical committees that are still operating and working despite all the uh, political tensions. Yet, as you know, climate change is a question that is very much intertwined with politics and, and decision making and economics. And so unless there is a common understanding at the leadership level, uh, it becomes very difficult to like achieve concrete uh, results. And just to give you an example of how this has affected some of our plans, Qatar established or helped establish the Dry Land Alliance, a global alliance uh, under the UN uh, that has uh, many numbers, uh, many members, pardon me, uh, more than 70 members, I, I believe. I cannot recall the exact numbers, so please don't quote me for that. The point is, uh, in 2018, we were supposed to have some sort of announcement, some sort of a comment agreement, some sort of a plan for the Dry Land Alliance. And in order to do that under the UN regulations, we needed a certain number of members. Unfortunately, for pure political reasons, the blockading countries decided to withdraw the support and also influence some other countries. And the result was this agreement with this plan was not endorsed at a global level and instead became an agreement that was endorsed by a number of, of countries. So once again, there is this much that we can achieve uh, with technical cooperation if the political will does not exist. Thank you. Um, another question from, is, is going back to a very large, a broad canvas again. This is a question from Fadi Haddadin of the MENA Council. And the question is as follows. With the fragmentation on the global scene, what role do you play, do you envisage for the UN in the Middle East and in Gulf reconciliation in particular? As, as you can imagine, the, the question is, uh, is a complicated one and a broad one. In general, I think that there are many agreements, uh, many channels that can be invoked in order to facilitate some sort of dialogue, uh, not only at the GCC level, but in the Arab region in general. Now, practically speaking, I think that the two act, despite all the criticism against the UN and its role and disintegration, etc., there are two main elements that the UN has helped maintain. Resilience of vulnerable populations, such as refugees, this is a reality. I mean, the umbrella of the UN, once again, despite all the criticism, the umbrella of the UN has helped us at least maintain the minimum standards of, of living for many vulnerable populations. So that's an important element. The other element is that the UN is at least one of the very few umbrella that are not contested yet. They're contested, but at least 
many countries are willing to come under the UN umbrella to do and to have concerted efforts, especially in areas of crises. We see this very clearly with Syrian refugees, with Palestinian refugees in the case of the UNRWA. So in the case of the UNRWA, for example, we know that many countries, including the United States, withdrew their support. But then other countries such as Germany, Qatar, other countries jumped in. But all of this could have not happened if it wasn't for that umbrella of the envelope. But of course, there is a lot that should be fixed. Well, one of the, one of the purposes of the UN is to be there to be blamed for other people's problems. Very uh, true. Uh, I have a question from Japan, from uh, Shikata-san. And the question is this. Technology matters in order to survive difficult times. How is Qatar going to develop or introduce cutting edge technologies? And if so, which ones? For example, there is a new technology to extract hydrogen and so store CO2 out of LNG or crude oil. If you adopt such a technology, Qatar can continue to make the most of her resources for a long time to come. Uh, I think you need not answer the specific question, but just the general one. How how do you see the role in cut of technology in Qatar's future? It's an important role that we realized more and more during the pandemic. The way we operate now at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is very different from the way we used to operate. The way we operate uh, when it comes to education with our universities and schools. If it wasn't for technology, many things could have not been uh, possible. Now, Qatar is investing in that. We have uh, Qatar Science for uh, uh, QSTP, Qatar Science and Technology Park. That is attracting a number of uh, small to medium businesses as well. Uh, we have, when it comes to the energy under the umbrella of Qatar Foundation, the Energy, Water and Environment Institute, and they've been doing some good research fairly good research around alternative uh, energy, like solar systems, etc. Yet, once again, there is a lot to be done. Now, on the other, on the other front, uh, when it comes to the extracting hydrogen, for example, Qatar now is exploring that. There aren't uh, concrete projects as far as I know, and the last time I checked uh, with uh, Qatar Petroleum, but I know that they're exploring uh, that area and those technologies. In addition to that, we have Qatar Investment Authority. That is our uh, sovereign fund. And Qatar Investment Authority recently started looking at Asia as a market. In the past, it was mostly focused on Europe and the United States, now Asia. And specifically in Asia, they're looking into those kinds of investments technology-related investments, green investments uh, as well. And the question of extracting hydrogen was one of the points. Once again, no concrete steps yet, but it's definitely in the pipeline. Thank you. I have a question here from uh, Mr. Ian Dyerson from Bazan Holdings. And the question is, is this. It's a very simple question. Your Excellency, do you see the blockade being lifted soon? <laughs> I know why this uh, question, by, by the name of the institution. <laughs> they, they belong to uh, the uh, Ministry of Defense in, in Qatar, yeah. and I uh, believe that they are under so much pressure, so uh, <laughs> I don't envy them, honestly. Okay. Um, there could be a, a hope for that, but it's going, if it's going to happen, it's going to be gradual. And I mentioned this one time before, it doesn't necessarily have to include all countries at once. I think uh, we, are, we have a few minutes left. So we have time for maybe two or three questions. First of all, I will give the floor to Mr. Ong Keng Yong of the uh, Rajaranam Institute, who uh, was, was also in the foreign ministry, a colleague of mine in the foreign ministry, who retired about the same time. King Yong, can you uh, unmute yourself, uh, show your face, and ask your question? 
Hello, yeah. Thank you, Bilahari. Yeah, we can't see you. Can you put on your video? Your handsome face okay. to be seen by everybody. <laughs> well, I'm trying to. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, thank you. I wanted to follow up on the earlier question about internal unity, which uh, you asked uh, our esteemed speaker. Uh, because in RSIS here, we talk a lot about social resilient and national resilient and how uh, Singapore and many of the Southeast Asian countries with all our diversity stick together. So looking at Qatar, definitely there will be uh, different opinions with regard to where uh, foreign policy or even domestic policy of uh, Qatar uh, should be heading. How is it that um, the Qatar government, Qatari government is able to maintain this uh, solidarity among its people. Um, of course, everything is well provided for, but uh, as a modern society with more well-educated young people, uh, shouldn't there be more diversity of opinion and how can this uh, energy from a different segment of the population in Qatar be harnessed towards the national goal of doing all these things that uh, uh, the assistant minister has been uh, expounding in the last one hour or so. So I thought I just want to have our esteemed speaker drill a bit further into some of the uh, strategic ways or strategic approaches the Qatari authorities have been uh, coalescing the citizens of Qatar for the national purpose. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Now, the makeup of the population of Qatar is obviously very different from Singapore. So there might be some parallels, but we also need to recognize some of the major differences. That said, I think one of the lessons learned for us in Qatar, especially after the blockade, is to keep this open channel with the grassroots level. And in the context of Qatar, now Qatar is a monarchy. So in the context of Qatar, it does not happen uh, through, let's say, elections or electing, let's say, the prime minister. Or... So the alternative to this is the following. Of course, there is the Shura Council elections, which is like the parliament-like elections. But then the other way to keep this communication for the grassroots level is actually through social media. And this might sound as, as awkward as it might sound, it actually worked out. To give you one, one example from the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, and I have firsthand experience with that because I'm, I'm leading the committee that's looking after comms and during the COVID-19 pandemic. We reached the point, especially in the first few months, where we had on daily basis to analyze more than 20,000 tweets. And Twitter is very popular here and Qatar more than Facebook, more than anything else. And I'll come to Facebook in a minute. And through doing this, we saw the trends. What are the main complaints? How are people perceiving the policies? And many times, policies have changed based on that. So in, in, in public policy terms, this is the policy cycle and this is the policy feedback. Of course, there are many other channels given the size of the population. Decision makers are normally within uh, easy access to, to individuals, especially uh, citizens. So it's not awkward for the citizen to ask for an appointment, for example, and meet a minister or even a higher level. But once again, this is maybe very Qatar specific due to the size of the population. But definitely media and social media as a representation of how people feel is one important element. That said, it's also easy to manipulate social media. I'll give you an example. 
And this is one of the main challenges we're facing as we are analyzing the social trends of Qatar, is the fact that we are also subjected to many media campaigns by the blockade countries through bots, etc. And that's why it becomes problematic for us to discern the genuine complaints uh, or the genuine trends from those that are manufactured in a way. And it becomes a technology question because the technology does, you know, the filtering, is this a bot, is this a real account, is this, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is not only exclusive to uh, citizens, it's actually everyone who lives in Qatar. So um, many people were stranded outside Qatar, like residents. And sometimes they don't have access to, you know, reach out to, to government authorities saying, I'm stranded in this country, right? So one way to do this is simply to write on social media, mention the entities, and then we go there, analyze whether this is a genuine account, reach out to them, call them directly to make sure it's a real person, uh, and then we look into the complaint and then, of course, once again, there is a capacity for this and, and how much and to what extent, but those details, this last example is very specific to time of crises. We cannot generalize this. Now, speaking of fragmentation in general, of policies, ideas, uh, we see this fragmentation also across the virtual circles. So Twitter is popular amongst citizens, but then Facebook amongst some other Arab communities. So if we want to analyze the needs of the Arab communities, we go to Facebook. And many of them, uh, I mean, started even gathering themselves and, and having some sort of an official account to organize uh, their presence in Qatar. The question needs a lot of thinking, honestly. I mean, maybe I'll have more thoughts about this and if you allow me to send them maybe in writing, because it's definitely a question with multiple layers. Sure, and it's a question that is of great importance to us. I think we are running out of time, but we have time perhaps, if with your permission, Excellency, two last questions. One uh, I've received in written form and one I'll give the floor uh, as the last word. The written question is about Qatar specifically. Uh, it is from Omar Alatas from the Alatas group. Excellency, what are the core competencies and capabilities you would like the Qatari population to develop in the future to be more rigorous, robust, and to be able to lead the region? That's even more complicated than the previous question. <laughs> All sorts of skills, honestly. Uh, all sorts of skills, but specifically for the needs of Qatar, I think we should just go to the traditional needs. It's a small population at the end of the day. Education, uh, medical sector, and the oil and gas. Those are the three main areas that are very crucial for our very existence. So having more people in those areas, definitely with the required skills. But then this does not mean, of course, that we don't look into arts and, and culture and media. And we, we need people in all areas. But I'm just trying to, if we are to set uh, priorities. In terms of, of traits in general and, and characteristics rather than hardcore skills, I think the one thing that we need to keep in mind is not to take things for granted and not to take natural resources for granted. Uh, as, uh, as they say, I mean, good things and great things come out of necessity. Uh, there is an Arab uh, sociologist, an Iraqi one, Ali Wardi. He's considered, I mean, he's written about this in the 50s. He's considered to be uh, one of the first Arab sociologists, if, if, if you wish. Um, so he's written about he called that akhlaq or the traits or the morals uh, or the ethics, that's more specific, the ethics of luxury and the ethics of need. And he said that each time this region thrived was out of the ethics of need. 
And each time it has declined, it was out of the ethics of luxury. Maybe this is something to keep in mind. Thank you. Okay. The last question is from Amin Lufti. Amin, uh, unmute yourself. Hello. Turn on yes, your can audio. you hear me? And introduce yes. yourself briefly. Yeah, thank you so much for this excellent talk, Your Excellency. My name is Amin Lutfi. I am a research fellow here at the Middle East Institute. I want to talk specifically about uh, a couple of points that you made in your, in your presentation. Uh, you started off by talking about how we're in this new age of declining multilateralism, international law, and human rights. But then when you started talking about how Qatar has responded to the blockade, you mentioned about a range of um, involvement in international law and how Qatar has really instigated a lot of these multilateral organizations and so on. So would you say then rather than these being declining, uh, they might actually be the, the multilateralism and international law might be given a new life by the small states? Absolutely. Thank you so much for the question. Now, if we talk about the situation as it should be, for sure. Multilateralism is for the good of all of us, the collective good of all, all of us. Now, we might, as human beings, figure out something else in the future. But until we do that, this is the best system we could come up with. Small states like Qatar find refuge in, in, in invoking some of those mechanisms. And I'm pretty sure that this is applicable to many other countries, especially small states. I think one of the main challenges we're facing is that some of the big players in the global arena are giving up on multilateralism. And the other challenge would be that many small countries would follow that. So absolutely, I, I totally agree. Um, I mentioned a report that we're working on uh, on the anniversary of the 20, uh, 27th, uh, the 75th, uh, pardon me, anniversary of, of the UN. And this, this report is actually in defense of multilateralism, but through problematizing the previous practices and experiences, not through blind uh, faith of multilateralism. There are many things that need to be reconsidered, many things that need to be restructured, but the core idea, I don't think yet we should give up on. Well, thank you very thank much. You. Uh, multilateralism has never progressed in a straight line, but it does progress. It progresses in waves and troughs, and I think we are in a bit of a trough right now. But if you look at the world as a whole, maybe there are certainly, for sure, a denser web of multilateral institutions, not just the UN, but around the UN, than there were 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago. Anyway, Excellency, we have come to the end of our time. I want to thank you again. You have been very generous with your time. You have been very informative, you have been very frank, you have been very direct, and as always, you have been extremely charming. You are Qatar's secret weapon, and we are greatly honored to have to have to host you, even though it's only virtually. And I hope before too long, we can meet again uh, in person, either in Doha or in Singapore. Thank you very much from all of us in Singapore and from your international audience, from Japan to the Middle East. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. It was such an honor, and I really enjoyed uh, the discussion with all of you, the colleagues, and I look forward to having you in Doha and as well visiting you in Singapore. And I look forward actually to having everyone who's uh, in the audience. I mean, maybe we can even share contacts after that. Thank you again. And by the way, please don't call me professor. I have no sort of professor, and I profess nothing. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you.